Okay, and we are starting. I want to kind of start today with a little bit of thought experiment. Uh, you guys are going to have to remember a little bit about functions to follow along with the experiment, but uh, you remember with this one? So, I was not a calc or a pre calc class, but uh, hopefully you remember the basic idea of functions. Let's suppose I have a strange kind of function. I am going to give the function the name p, and the function has domain r2, so it's a two dimensional set of real numbers, coordinates, and its codomain or outputs is in R3. So I have a function that takes inputs from two dimensional space and outputs in three dimensional space. So R2 is like, you know, your xy plane and then there is an x, y, and z plane. And what this function does is it will take a coordinate from here and then it connects it to a coordinate over there in 3D. Okay. Um, I am going to define the function in the following way. Okay. So this is the input. So I take an xy coordinate over here, and I'm going to get three coordinates over here. And here's how I'm going to calculate the coordinates. Um, I'm going to take a times the x coordinate plus b times the y coordinate comma, so that's the first, that's the x component over here, there's going to be a y component and a z component over here. Um, in the second coordinate, I'm going to take c times the x plus d times the y that you gave me as input, comma, and then I'm going to take e times the x plus f times the y, right? So I go from a situation where I have two coordinates living in R2, I now have three coordinates, so this is an output in R3. Okay? Everyone kind of following me so far? Okay. Now A, B, C here, A, B, C, D, E, F are constants. All right, so these are just numbers, perhaps predetermined, um, but if you give me an input, I'm going to take this list of numbers that I already have, and I'm going to multiply the inputs you give me in this particular way, and I'm going to arrange them in three separate groups. Now. Um, let's pretend I have another function, which I'm going to call q. Now this function uh, takes two dimensional things and connects it to something else that's also in two dimensions. So this goes from the xy plane back to the xy plane. Um, let's say the definition of this one is So it inputs two coordinates and it outputs two other coordinates. So that's how these functions actually work. Now, here are some questions. Now, you're going to have to remember how uh, to compose functions here. If I were to ask you what is, say, uh, q of p of x, y. Or what is P of Q of X, Y? So do you remember what this notation means? It means you're going to take, so let's say we have three sets. I have one function that takes something here. It's the domain. It outputs something over here. Call that function F. And then I'll have another function that takes this output and moves it to something else call that function g, then the function g of f is the one that goes all the way from the beginning to all the way at the end, sort of cuts out the middleman. So what this means is uh, g will take whatever output f gave you, and it will take that as the input. So it's like f passes something to g, and then g passes it to something else. right? And we make that notation by this. It's called the composition of functions. So basically what I'm saying is here, I want to take the output of P and plug it as the input of Q. And this one is saying I want to take the output of Q and plug it to be the input of P. Okay? So now 
What do you think the first one would look like if you were to take this uh, idea? So Q of P of XY is going to be like Q, and I'm going to plug P of XY into the Q, right? Now, this is like me taking Q of this coordinate, you know, AX plus BY, CX plus DY, BX plus FY. Now, what would that be equal to? How would I actually calculate that? What do you think? How would I actually do that? What would the answer look like? So Q, so here it's Q. It takes two things and then it spits out two other things, right? So what would this do? Yeah? Well, x plus by is going to be x. Yeah, it's, you can think of this like the new x, right? And you can think of this like the new big y, right? And we're just going to take these two and do that. However, you would have noticed that there's more than just an x and a y. There's another thing here, right? So, in other words, Q is not going to know what to do. Q only knows how to handle two things. You gave it three things. Way too much information, Q doesn't understand, right? It's kind of like me asking you to do something in four dimensions. You've lived your entire life in three dimensions. I don't know what it means to do something in four dimensions. Draw this picture in four dimensions. Can't do it. Too much information. The brain doesn't stretch so far. Q has no idea what to do with this, right? Q knows how to do with two things. It is an X and a Y. I just gave Q three things to do. Undefined. Function breaks. Right? It's not going to work. Like, I, I don't know what is this extra dimension here. I live in two dimensions. I don't get the third dimension. Same way that if you live in three dimensions, you don't understand what it even means to visualize four dimensions, five dimensions, six dimensions. It just, you can't stretch that far. So this will actually be a problem. You would not actually be able to actually do that, right? It, it's kind of the way like if you were had f of x equals the square root of x and you had g of x equals negative 1. Could you plug this into that and get another number? Like if this guy only understands real numbers, you can't actually plug the function here. It doesn't understand, right? So the function just can't understand all the information. Sometimes you'll give it something, it won't make sense. Sometimes you give it too much information, like in a dimension that it can't comprehend. So this is not going to work out. What about the other way, though? What if I looked at P of Q of XY? So this means that the P, I'm going to plug in the Q of XY into the P. This means Inside of the P, I am going to plug in this coordinate, the GX plus HY comma the IX plus JY. So now this is like, so this is like an X and that's like a Y, right? And P knows exactly what to do with the X and the Y. What does P do? Well, it's going to take a times the x plus b times the y, right? That's the rule. So it's going to take a times this, gx plus hy, and then it's going to take b times that, ix plus jy. Then it's going to put a comma, and it's going to fulfill the rest of the procedure, right? Then what's the next thing it was going to do? It's going to take cx plus dy, right? That was the next rule. So I'm going to take c times the x, which in this case is gx plus hy. I'm going to take d times the y, which is ix plus jy, comma. What else does it do? It takes e times the x plus f times the y. 
So it's going to take E times that guy, GX, plus HY. It's going to take F times that guy, IX, plus J1. Right? Now let's start to simplify things. So it's algebra. Uh, we're going to add like terms pretty much. Group all the X's, group all the Y's in each coordinate, right? So how many X's do I have in the first coordinate? Well, I have A times G plus B times I. Right? And how many Y's do I have? Well, I have A times H plus B times J. Comma. Moving over here. How many x's do I have and how many y's do I have? Well, I have c times g plus d times i x's. I have c times h plus d times j y's, comma. How many x's do I have over here? How many y's do I have over there? I have e times g x's plus f times i. And then for the y's, I have e times h, plus f times j. It's a lot of algebra. I know it's not an algebra class, but we're kind of following along here, the idea. Okay. Huh? So this is algebra. It's just I'm plugging functions one into the other. Okay. So did you guys write this down? Make sure you copy this down because I, I want to erase it. I don't want to remember it. You guys have it? actually really cumbersome to write that down, as you can see. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to think of these things in another way. Um, I'm going to change the, the change the notation to actually make this easier and more palatable. Okay. So, because that was just a lot of algebra, a lot of parentheses all over the place, a, a lot of commas. many bits of information right there. So here's how I'm going to decide to write this notation. So my P of X was the AX plus BY CX plus DY uh, EX plus FY. Okay. So here's how I'm going to write this one down. Um, One, to avoid this long string of things, um, I'm going to actually write it vertically to start out. So instead, write the coordinate instead of as a row, let's write it as a column. AX plus BY, CX plus DY, BX plus FY. Okay? That's the first thing. So instead of this string that can get really long, I just compress it to be in a very short <coughs> vertical width. But let's say I, I'm even lazier than that, and I really don't want to have to copy down anything that I absolutely don't have to. You would notice here that I can see a pattern by arranging it vertically. Notice that everything in the first situation, everything in the first column of these things, has an x attached to it, right? While everything in the second column has a y attached to it. Now, if I just make a mental note that everything in the first column is x and everything in the second column is y, there's no need to write x and y, really. It's kind of superfluous. So let me just take out the x's and take out the y's. I just understand that the first column is going to be the coefficients of the x's. The second column is going to be the coefficients of the y's. So I'm going to now, because I'm very lazy, I'm going to write it this way. 
now things are starting to look a little bit familiar. We looked at something that looked like that last class. Let's play the same game with the other objects. Uh, let's look at q of x, y in this way. Uh, we looked, and that was the By the same mechanism, I can think of this as this object. Now, what we did first was we tried to find Q uh, of P. So, this object, if I were to write it down, what it would look like is it would look like that, right? And as far as we were concerned, this was undefined, made no sense. The other object was P of Q. Now, this guy ended up looking like what? Well, it was A, B, C, D, E, F, and circle, uh, G, H, I, J. Right? But that one actually did make sense, and we actually plugged in, we expanded, we combined like terms, and we could get that that was equal to something. Now, Read what we had for that long list and kind of uh, write it out like this, uh, vertically. So, what was the first x in the first coordinate, the coefficient? It was what? A g plus b i. A g plus b i. Uh, what was the y in the first coordinate? A h plus b j. A h plus b j. Uh, what was the x in the second coordinate? Cg plus d i. Cg plus d i. D, d what? Yeah. Yeah. D i. I thought you said n. Uh, what was the y in the second coordinate? Ch plus d j. Uh, what was the x in the third coordinate? And what was the y in the second in the third coordinate? Anything look familiar? What would actually happen if I were to take this row and dot product it with that column? I would get A G plus B I. And if you look over here, well look at that, that's A G plus B I. What if I were to take uh, this row times that column? Well, I would get AH plus BJ. And you look over here. Oh, look at that. That's AH plus BJ, which is the answer that we got before. And similarly, I can go through CD times GI, <coughs> CGDI. Take this times that. I would get CH plus DJ. Uh, take E times that, and I would get EG plus FI, and if I take the slash rows times that, I would get that. And again, because I'm really lazy, and I know in my head that I'm really thinking of these things as functions, not compositions, I don't even write that circle anymore. Now, why did the first one not make sense? Well, if you think of it as a function, it makes sense why it didn't make sense. This guy was trying to plug into that guy, but he had too much information that overwhelmed this guy. He wasn't able to compute it. He had an output that had too many dimensions for this part. Now, one thing you might notice is that the P went from R2 to R3. What you will notice that in, when I wrote that shorthand, I ended up with two rows, uh, three rows, and two columns. So this 3 and the 2 actually have very important meanings. See, this 2 here was the dimensions of the input. And the 3 here is the dimensions of the output. Right? 
So now when you try to connect these guys together, here was the problem with the first one. This guy took an input in two dimensions. He outputted something in three dimensions and tried to pass it to that guy. This guy only takes inputs in two dimensions, though. So when someone tried to pass a three-dimensional thing to that guy, he's like, I, he can't hold it. I don't have all this information. It's not going to work. The, the output of this guy did not match up with the input of that guy. So function broke down. On the other hand, this guy is a 3 by 2. That guy is a, a 2 by 2. This guy took an input in two dimensions. He outputted something in two dimensions. <laughs> then he passed that information to the next guy. Now that's fine, because this guy is prepared to it take inputs in two dimensions. So everything gets passed on easily. He, I know exactly what to do with these two things that he gave me. I'm going to take those two things and output it as three things. Now, if you look at the big picture, so what happens here is that P went from R2 to R, uh, where are we? This actually starts here. Q went from R2 to R2. P goes from R2 to R3. So this guy starts in two dimensions, outputs something in two dimensions, he passes it along to P. P takes that thing and outputs something in three dimensions. Now, if I were to cut out, write this as one big thing, that would be PQ. Now, if I look at how does PQ have to behave, what is his inputs and outputs? Well, he's going to be the input from the very first guy and the output from the very last guy. So when it comes to this new function, what matters is the very beginning and the very end. What's over here? The very beginning and the very end. So these outside numbers here can tell you exactly about the nature of the bigger guy here. That is why matrix multiplication is the way it is. Because it wasn't multiplication at all. You see, most people think of matrices as just rectangular arrays of numbers, and they're very useful when you think of them as that. However, the people who invented matrices were thinking of a very different kind of object. They were thinking of functions, more specifically linear functions, functions that look kind of like y plus mx plus d, kind of like straight lines, um, that were multi-dimensional. We could go from any dimension we want to any other dimension. I can think of a line coming from three-dimensional space to five-dimensional space, or from seven-dimensional space to 15-dimensional space, or anything else. And sometimes we might want to do what we do with functions. We want to add to them. We want to subtract these functions. We want to take one function and plug into another function. and then rules started to emerge from that. Because if you're adding two, two functions, what do you do? You combine like terms, right? So here, the terms correspond to the coordinates. So if I want to play that game with this object, if I want to add two of them, I add corresponding coordinates. That made sense, because it made sense for functions. When I want to multiply, quote unquote, um, what that meant for us was to actually function composition. I want to take one and plug into the other one. And so now we wanted to write down a shorthand rule to be able to do that. This is matrix multiplication. Right? So the reason why it's not obvious to a lot of people is because everyone thinks somehow this is supposed to be multiplication. The truth is it's not. The truth is it's actually a composition of two functions. Right? And then once you understand that, that these matrices really, they're just representations of functions in the background, a lot of the rules will now start to make sense. You'll start to see why some things are obvious and why some things are not. Because if you remember from pre-calc, if you take two functions and go f of g versus g of f, you don't always get the same thing. In fact, they could be very different. In fact, one might be defined while the other isn't, like if you have a square root and a negative one. right? Sometimes they give you the same thing. Sometimes they both output x. Whenever that happens, we call these functions inverses of each other. And we can also talk about that. And so, yeah, I kind of wanted to show you that last time we covered matrix multiplication, and I, I know it was like this, and it's like, well, why would they do it like that? 
Why are these math people trying to make everything complicated and mess with my brain? It's not that we wanted it to be complicated, it's just that we had a certain thing in mind when we were inventing this operation. Right? We weren't thinking of multiplying things, we were thinking of jumping through multiple dimensions in one swoop. And we wanted an idea that captured that. Matrix multiplication is that idea. Sure, the name could use some work. We didn't have a good marketing department, you know? So, you know, everyone calls it multiplication. They're like, well, this is so weird. What, how is that multiplication? Well, technically speaking, it's not. Um, so, when you're wondering, why does these numbers have to match up and that tells you what's going on in the answer? Well, this is why. These have to match up because to pass information from one function to the other, they, they need to speak the same language. They need to be in the same dimensions. And then, uh, the outer numbers actually tells you the very beginning and the final destination. And that's why the outer numbers, if the inner numbers match up, the outer numbers are going to tell you how the big function that connects it, the beginning to the end is going to behave. Right? So what you ended up with is a function that went from two dimensions output in three dimensions. And so this guy is supposed to be something that starts at two and ends at three. And that's how you get a three by two matrix. So there are going to be times when because of this idea, because when we are looking at matrices, we're actually looking at functions, some rules are gonna feel very obvious. When you're adding two functions, it's a very obvious operation. To plug one function into the other, as you can see, it wasn't very obvious. It took a lot of algebra. There were a lot of intermediate calculations to get some huge mess at the end. And so matrix multiplication is going to be like this huge mess. But again, you're multiplying things out in a predictable order. You'll be able to actually write down in a predictable way what the huge mess is going to end up being. And so that's why this definition, that's where the definition came from. So it wasn't just uh, math people randomly inventing something just to mess with non-math people. There, there was a point, there was a goal. And thinking of matrices as functions, is a, it's a very powerful thing. We can solve a lot of problems by thinking about them that way. Um, this notation is super versatile. There, there are many things that we can use that notation to talk about. And throughout the semester, we will be looking at a, a several such things. But I kind of wanted you to have an appreciation for what's really going on here. Yeah? So you use this, it's not just composition functions, it's also um, oh, system of equations. System of, yeah, you can so think of them as system of equations, because system of equations, they have expressions that look like this yeah. in it. It's just linear equations, yeah. So every time that column would be considered the x and that column would be considered the y? Yeah, there's like a, a program in there. In fact, if you plug in like a system of equations into Wolfram Alpha or a graphing calculator or something, your calculator actually translates it to this. It solves the system using these, and then it outputs the answer. It just knows whatever showed up in the first column, that's the x. Whatever showed up in the second, that's the y. And then it, it outputs that on the screen. What it was thinking was this. Because as you can see, that's a lot nicer, tighter. We can pack a lot of information in a very small space, as opposed to your calculator working out like this like, long string of parentheses. Um, it, the, the operations add up. So think of it like a matrix makes it a much more efficient operation. So there are a lot of things, so many things, that when you just type something into your calculator, you're just thinking of it as something completely different, your calculator literally interprets that as matrices, and it does all sort of stuff with it, and then it reinterprets the answer. So we're, we're gonna see a bunch of stuff like that, but I just wanted to, you know, to like the one student in class who actually was interested in knowing why is that? Well, now you know why. Let's move on. We're going to finish the multiplication examples, and hopefully we'll also get to talk about uh, the systems of equations idea. And that's going to bring us, put us in a nice spot for next week. Uh, so let's get to that. So examples from last week. So hopefully you guys actually tried this.
again, it's one of those things you just get used to applying the rules, just practice a bunch of problems until it starts to feel easy. To the point where the only thing you have to worry about is not adding something incorrectly or dropping a sign or something like that. <coughs> So essentially the number of columns in a matrix tells you the dimensions of the input space and the number of rows tell you the dimensions of the output space. And that's kind of why things have to line up the way they need to in order to... I believe we did both A and B already. So C was A times B. B was B times A. B was A times C. F was C times A, C was C times D, H is D times C. Now, yes, we're applying the same idea here, but it, it's really just to get a lot of practice under our belts. If we're not used to doing this all the time, um, it's very easy to make a mistake. So let's run through a few examples. C. A times A. So that's going to be 1 minus 1, 2, 1 times 1, 0, 0, 2, 1. Um, is that possible? No. How do you know? So this is a 2 by 2. This is a 3 by 2. These don't match up. So that breaks it. right? So this is undefined. And now we know why. Right? The two functions don't speak the same language. One is on a much higher dimension than the other one. What about the other way around, D times A? Would they understand each other if they just turn things around? <laughs> you know what, we've got to turn our relationship around, man. It's like, we're going down the wrong path, you know, let's just start from scratch and like, do the opposite. Now this is going to be a 3 times 2, that's going to be a 2 times 2, and hey, now they speak the same language, now they can actually connect. This guy can pass information to that guy, and the result is going to be a 3 by 2. Right? So that one actually works. So, all right, someone go. What do we write here? 1 times 1 plus 0 times 2. 1 times 1 plus 0 times 1. And you close that, because you know that's supposed to be 2 two columns here, then go down. Zero times one, plus zero times two, two times two. Two times two times. Zero times going to be that guy. And again, remember, I kind of fill it out with the same pattern. Always 1, 2 in the parentheses. Here, always minus 1 and 1 in the parentheses. And if you look across the rows, you would notice that the rows of the left guys are in there. 0 and 1 is always in front of the parentheses in the first row. 0 and 2 is always in front of the parentheses in the second row. 3 and 1 is always in front of the parentheses in the third row. Kind of write it out in a pattern. Um, so if you make a mistake, it's easy to catch it. And now you just uh, pretty much simplify these. This is just uh, 1. This is minus 1. This is 4. This is 2. This is 5. This is minus 2. on that, we see the pattern. Ooh. Let's do it again. You really just want to just do a bunch of these. And by the way, you can check your answers on, I mean, you won't be able to use it on test, but you can use your graphing calculator to check the answer. You can also use like Wolfram Alpha. I, I can show you how you actually type out. So first of all, symbol lab, this was mentioned in the syllabus. Symbolab.com, it has matrix templates. 
right? So you can actually pick a matrix template and actually <coughs> type in the numbers and put them beside each other. It'll know you mean multiply and it'll give you the results. You can check your answers. Um, in math, in uh, Wolfram Alpha though, you'd have to type out You'd have to type out the matrices. So it has a way you can do this. So let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six. What you would type is squiggly brackets represents the entire matrix. And then you put each row in the comma, uh, between commas. And they have their own squiggly brackets with commas, right? So you would type one comma two, three comma four, and five comma six. <coughs> if you type this expression into Wolfram Alpha, it will understand you mean a matrix. Um, I'm pretty sure it also works with square brackets, but I've always used squiggly brackets, so I know that works. Um, so it'll understand that as a matrix. You just type each row. Separate, uh, separate them by squiggly brackets and then put one big squiggly bracket around it and it interprets that. That's the syntax to type out a matrix. So you could actually type this out and you could type asterisk times another matrix to be multiplied. You can multiply by a scalar, you can raise to a power, you can do all sorts of things. That's just an FYI. A times C, 1 minus 1, 2, 1. C is 1, 2, 3, 0, 2, 4. Does that one work? Yes. <coughs> this here is a 2 by, three. 2 by 3, and this is a 2 by 2. So those work out, they connect, and the result should be a 2 by 3. So we can uh, even start um, writing those out. It should be a 2 by 3. You know that's how, that's how big it has to be. And now you just fill in each slot. First row times first column. 1, one times 0 plus minus 1 times actually, 1 times 1 plus minus 1 times 0. Over here, 1 times 2 plus minus 1 times 2. Over here, 1 times 3 plus minus 1 times 4. Move down, 2 times 1 plus 1 times 0. Move down to 2 times 2 plus 1 times 2. And across, 2 times 3 plus 1 times 4. Now you simplify, that's 1, this is a minus 1 here, so that's 2 minus 2, that's 0, uh, 3 minus 4, minus 1, 2, 6, and that's 6 plus 4, that's 8. So that's A times C, uh, let's look at C times A.
guys see that or what's happening? Okay. Okay, so that was some light in there. Okay. Zero times one uh, plus two times zero plus four times three. Then we have a zero times zero plus two times two plus four times one. And that would be one plus zero plus nine. Zero plus four plus three. Zero plus zero plus twelve. Zero plus four plus four. Didn't make any silly arithmetic errors, that's the answer. And DC. This is a two by uh, this is a two by three, and this is a three by two. These match up, so we can actually do the multiplication. Okay, make this a real practice one. Heads down, you actually do it while I'm doing it, and then you can look up and see if we have the same answer. We should all have the same answer. Okay, so don't watch me. Look down and do it yourself. Make sure you know how to do this. We all get it, the same numbers. So that's uh, that's matrix multiplication. And now, if you ever think matrix multiplication is weird, no, you know it's not weird. Let's all understand each other. It's not actual multiplication. It's doing something else. Sometimes you look at other people, they're so weird. No, you don't know what their situation is. You don't know what they're trying to do. Right, you just look and you judge them because you think one way they are, they're, they're doing something else. They're on a different path, right? Uh, yeah, so that's multiplication. Now, let's look at, uh, describe this, but I'm going to write out two very specific sized examples, like a two by two system, and maybe like a two by three system. So for example, let's say I have a system of equations and it looks like the following. Um, Ax plus dy, cx plus dy equals Right. So the A, the B, the C, the D, the E, the F, these are just numbers. These are constants, right? So it could look something like 
2x minus 3y equals 7 and 4x plus 2y equals 9, right? So like this is like that, like the, the a, the b, the e, the c, the d, the f, they represent numbers, right? So you'll see an object like this, right? Now, what you'd realize is that this is equivalent to by just equality of matrices, right? Just take each side, throw them in matrices, and this is actually works out. Here, this is a uh, two by one, that's a two by one. The equal sign means corresponding entries are equal, so that means the ax plus by equals e, and the cx plus by equals f, which is exactly the information that was presented. I just throw both sides into a, a, a matrix. And now what you can realize is that, so this is uh, equivalent to by equality of matrix property. Now this is equivalent to, equivalent to, notice that this guy I can actually write in this way. I can actually write A, B, C, D, and X, Y over here. And why is that the same? Well, if we follow the rules of matrix multiplication, here this is a two by two, this is a two by one, they communicate, and the result should also be a two by one, which you notice that this is a two by one, and how you'd actually calculate it is that you'll take the row times the column. So it's the ax plus the by, that's going to give me that. And then the cx plus the dy, that's going to give me that. So this matrix multiplication is equivalent to that bigger matrix. Right? So I can start out with a system of equation, and I can express it using matrices and matrix multiplication in this way. Right? Uh, now, this generalizes very nicely. You can do this uh, with any size system of equations. So, another example. Let's say I have, what did I mention? It? Like a 2 by 3. Okay. Like ax plus by uh, plus c, c, d, d, f. Let's stop there. Let's say I have two equations that look like that, right? So they look like uh, linear equations, like uh, everyone has the power of one. And I can then express this by A, B, C, D, E, F times X, Y, Z equals G, H. This system can be expressed as this equation. And again, you would realize that if I do the row times the column, I would get this. Row times that column, I would get that. By doing this matrix multiplication, I get exactly what was before. And so here you'll notice this is a 2 by 3 times a 3 by 2 by, uh, times a 3 by 1. And that actually makes sense that this, this thing all makes sense. We can actually multiply. Over here, there's a 2 by 1. So now, you would start to notice some patterns here, hopefully. Notice that the, uh, the first matrix has all the coefficients of the variables, right? So this, the first matrix, so this guy is, uh, it's an example of a matrix equation. So if you have a system of equations, you write it as matrices, we call that a matrix equation. Now in that matrix equation, you'll notice certain patterns. You will have all your coefficients in one matrix. And notice that they kind of show up in pretty much the same order that you would write the equation down in the first place, so that's convenient. Um, notice here, you'll have all the variables in the second part. And notice here, you'll always you'll have the constants on the other side. Now, this because it holds all the coefficients, and math people are very creative when naming things. We call this the coefficient matrix. <laughs> it's true. We're great at naming stuff. So. Take more math classes, you'll realize this. This theorem is fundamental to all of calculus. What are we going to call it? 
fundamental theorem calculus. <laughs> This allows us to calculate the mean value between two points. What are we going to call it? Mean value theorem. <laughs> so this is called the coefficient matrix. This guy is called the solution matrix. Because normally when you're trying to solve equations, you're solving for the variables, right? So these variables. If you can find them, that's going to be the solution. Um, and this is just called, has a bunch of constants in it, so <coughs> constant matrix sounds great. So that's the name that we call these guys. And we have this generic notation. Like if anyone were to randomly come with a notation to represent some random function, y equals f of x, why not? Right? They, we just have these letters that we like. Um, we generally call the coefficient matrix by the letter A. So these are just generic notations here. We generally call this one little x with a vector over it. And we generally call this one D with a little vector over it. And so, um, the generic expression ax equals b, whenever anyone writes that down in a math book, they're thinking of this in particular. You just might not know the sizes of them. So ax equals b means we're thinking of a matrix. That's the first thing. Based on how equality of matrices work and how matrix multiplications work, we can express a list of equations, linear equations, as matrices in this particular way. So now we are able to talk about systems of equations using matrices. And now you might wonder, well, why would we even want to do that? I was fine without matrices. I went my whole life without thinking about these equations this way. Why do I need to start? Well, there are many benefits, but first, I think we just need to when you'll have several equations in the same variables occurring as a group and you are interested in solving it as a group meaning you want to find the x and y values that will work in both equations at the same time right? so that's what it would mean by solving the system So 
all the steps that I make with matrices are going to see that these were equivalent steps that we made with the equations in the first place. Right? So that's going to give you a little bit of intuition, but then you're going to realize that the intuition doesn't really help much, so we're going to formalize the steps I take and make it a little bit more abstract, but if you just follow them as abstractions, it, everything will work out, turns out. Uh, so, um, I'm going to do this by the elimination method. So that's when you try to eliminate one variable and <coughs> keep the other one. And But since calculators and computers do things this way, we're sort of going to think like a calculator or a computer, which means while we're manipulating these things, it's in our RAM memory, which means the moment we stop writing down some information, we forget it, okay? So at any given time, while I'm manipulating these equations, I'll keep writing down the two sets of equations and apply manipulations as I'm going, right? That's the, that's the rule. But the idea should be clear. Um, so, it'll be a lot more than you normally write down in high school, but the idea should, is exactly the same. Okay, so let's say I wanted to eliminate the x's so I could solve for the y's or something like that. What would I do? Yeah? Multiply the top equation by 2. Okay, so I can, so this is equation 1, that's equation 2. I can multiply the top one by 2. And then uh, do what? Subtract. Now I can subtract. So I can take who do you, how do you, which order do you want to subtract? It doesn't matter, but pick one. One plus two. Right. So <coughs> let's call this new equation three. So I want to take this minus that. So let's say I'm going to take three minus two, and I'm going to write that result down here. So this minus that, I get zero x's. Right? Plus this minus that, I get seven y's. Right? And this minus that, I get ten. Right? Are you with me so far? Uh, so those the numbers I wanted. anything was wrong with that, but I, I just don't want to deal with fractions. Keep things whole number, I'm going to explain the, uh, something for the first time. Okay? Now, uh, what do we realize? In this equation, we're able to solve for the y, because now there are no x's really. Right? Now, how do we normally solve for the y? We can just divide both sides by 7. Right? Now, again, I'm going to keep the first one, because I don't want to forget anything. It's stored in RAM memory. And then I can just <coughs> call this new equation equation 4. I took 4, and I'm going to divide by 7. Um, let's uh, reduce this. This becomes uh, x plus 2y equals 3. Let's bring it back to the first version. And here I have 0x plus 1y equals 1. 
that's equation five. Okay, so now we're in this situation. And that's actually a nice situation for y, right? Because the second equation tells me exactly what y is. Okay? Now I'm keeping all the coefficients for a very specific reasons for the comparison. Now let's do the same thing for the x's. How would we actually accomplish the same idea for the x's? Well, we need to eliminate the y from the first one, right? To get the same thing for x, right? There's one x plus two y. Get make that zero y, and I'll be able to talk about the x's. How do I get that to be zero y? Multiply the bottom <coughs> by two. Multiply the bottom by two. So leave one x plus two y equals three. I'm going to take the bottom and multiply it by two. Or let's do it another way. Let's multiply by minus 2 just for some variety. All right, so this is 5 times minus 2. And now what can I do? If I can kind of add them, right? Now, the second line was fine, so I'm actually going to put it back. That one I actually like. It gave me the y right away. What I wanted to change was the first line. It had too much information. I wanted to eliminate the y. So when I add these, I'm going to put the result in the first one. So 1x plus 0x gives me 1x. And then plus add these two gives me 0y. Add these two, I get a 1. Okay. So now at the end of the day, what's the solution to this system? <coughs> x equals 1. And the y equals 1. Now if you go back to the original, you'll notice that if you were to plug these guys in, That actually makes sense, right? 1 plus 2 times 1 is 3. 2 times 1 minus 3 times 1 is minus 1, right? So these is, this is a list of variables where that actually makes sense, okay? Now, uh, yeah, hopefully you copy this down. Remember this process. I'm going to do an equivalent process here. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. First, write this as a matrix equation. 1, 2, 2, minus 3, times x, y, times 3, minus 1. And I'll define this in general next time. Uh, you say you augment the system. And augment is, again, just a way to block out all superfluous information. I know it's x, y. So let's just put 1, 2, 2, minus 3. And I'm going to put a line to represent the equal sign, and then there's a 3 and a 1 on this side. So this is called the augmented matrix for the system. We'll define that later. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to play that exact game with this object. So here's what that would look like. One, two. 3 and 2 minus 3 minus 1. Okay. Now, again, I'm thinking the same idea. I want to eliminate one of the guys so that I can find the other guy, right? So I know that the first column is dealing with the x, the second column is dealing with the y, so I might make the choice, hey, let me solve for the y first. In order to solve for the y, I'm going to eliminate the x's. So what I want to do is to make this column, these numbers here, they must line up to be the same numbers so that I can subtract one from the other. So what I did was I multiplied this by 2. I go through and just multiply that entire row by 2. Right? So let's say this is row 1 from the previous step times 2. And that was, and what I did now uh, is I'm going to take this row 1 times 2, and I'm going to subtract the old row 2, right? Same idea that we did last time. So this minus that, I get 0, and this minus that, I get 7, and this minus that, I get 7. So that row that we had, 0x plus 7y equals 7, this is now equivalent to this line, right? <coughs> now, we didn't want 7y's, we want one of the y's, so what we did after that was we just took this, the old row 2, and we divided it by 7. Just to get the 1 in here and the 0 there. 
Um, now this was an extra step that we didn't have to do, but I think we just recopied this and then we moved over here, and at that point we reduced it back to what the original was. And then we realized here we eliminated the number in the first column and left the number in the, the second column. We now want to do a similar thing to the top row, uh, where we're going to leave the number in the first column and, and eliminate the one <coughs> in the second column. So what I'm going to do is try to get that to happen. And what we did was this time we multiplied this by minus 2. So here I took the previous row 2 and multiplied by minus 2. And what then I'm going to do is we added these two. So I, I'm going to take the row 1 that I have here. I'm going to add it to this new thing. So 0 plus the 1 is 1, minus 2 plus the 2 is 0, and minus 2 plus 3 gives us the 1. Now what I'm going to do is that to make it look nice, I'm going to take that row 2 and divide it back by negative 2 to bring it to a nice uh, situation here. And now I'm in a very nice situation. Now you notice I'm in a situation that says 1x plus 0y equals 1, and 0x plus 1y equals 1. Right? Once I get bring the matrix to this point, that's a pretty convenient form. Um, I also want you to appreciate that this was also a pretty convenient form. I could have stopped the process here, solve for y, and then go back there and plug it in and solve for x. Right? These two things are actually pretty important. This form here is called a row echelon form, and I'll define this in detail next time. This one here, where you can literally see the answer by looking at the, the, the matrix, it's called the reduced row echelon form. So the idea is the same game we can play with elimination from high school, we can play the same game with matrices and bring our matrices to convenient forms where we can talk about the solution to the system. Do you have a quick uh, question? We're just here asking for any of these names. So we need uh, I will be saying that name in class, so yeah, you need to know this. But I, I, I haven't defined it yet. I'll define everything in detail next time. I just wanted to get the idea of the game we're playing with. Right? So when we're doing these things with matrices, there's, a, there's something we're comparing it to. The ideas should be similar. So we're not just randomly moving around numbers. There's a goal. We want a certain situ favorable situation while we're moving these numbers around. That's going to be important. Because otherwise, it would take forever moving numbers around and never get anywhere. You want to know what the goal is. This way, the way, 1, 0, 0, 1, that is a very important kind of expression. I'll also talk about that expression next time. Something like that would be called an identity matrix. I'll identify that next time. Uh, we'll stop there. Maybe come up with another random system and try this game yourself. Uh, but we'll get more practice next time.